minimum government but maximum governance. This is what was announced in 2014 by the present Prime Minister of India when he began his first term in office. Meaning that people will be relieved from the burden of big government. It was very exciting. Now, this was in line with the conservative mantra of the West, where for many years, politicians had been promising that they'd withdraw from people's everyday lives and most institutions would be put into the hands of informal or semi-formal bodies made up of everyday people. At the other end of the world, the President of the United States of America said much the same thing throughout his election campaign in 2015-2016. He even tried to introduce many reforms early in his term. Today, there is duplication and redundancy everywhere. Billions and billions of dollars are being wasted on activities that are not delivering results for hardworking American taxpayers and not even coming close. This order requires a thorough examination of every executive department and agency to see where money is being wasted, how services can be improved, and whether programs are truly serving American citizens. But, like many proponents of small government in the past, both Modi and Trump actually transformed their governments into bigger and bigger edifices. Inefficiency, wasteful expenditure, slothfulness, corruption, polemical grandstanding, these remained as prominent as in the past. Meanwhile, the old existing problems of these countries remained just as unsolved. And then, coronavirus struck. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Age of Pandemic series. This is the 11th episode. In case you haven't seen the other episodes, please check them out and share your thoughts in the comments below. For those of you who haven't subscribed, please do so that you don't miss a video. Today, I want to highlight some of the failures of big governance that have become more glaring in a pandemic. Corruption, a second wave of COVID-19, a global mental health crisis. These are all signs that governments have failed its people. We need to think about how to modernize governance. And in that context, I'm going to talk about an effective system already in place in one state in India. Now, there are some notable exceptions like New Zealand and South Korea. But governments around the world, whether democratically elected or enforced on the people, have proven utterly ineffective in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Governments of most countries have failed to deliver their people from lives of fear and deaths of agony despite having all the resources at their command. We are now in the seventh month since the first case of COVID-19 was detected in Wuhan in China. Lockdowns, shutdowns, then easing of lockdowns followed by reclamping of lockdowns. But the numbers tell a gloomy story. Huge governments with great armies, yet testing kits, hospital beds, and even the oxygen equipment that is so vital for treating COVID-19 patients all these continue to be in short supply, seven months into the pandemic. The icing on the cake, as it were, is corruption. It is thriving as people are dying. Corruption is the bedfellow of all governments, democratic or not. And the fact that corrupt officials, politicians and contractors are continuing to suck our blood is proof that people have not at all been empowered by democratic governance. We are helplessly watching people get rich off coronavirus loot. Let me show you some of the global experience. In Latin America, one of the most affected parts of the world, there are rackets thriving in sanitizers, masks, vital medicines, even in coffins and body bags for the dead. Corrupt government officials and businessmen are involved in these rackets. In this report, the Attorney General of Ecuador is quoted as saying that people are dying on the streets because the hospital system has collapsed. She says, to profit from the pain of others is immoral. This report is about nursing homes in the United States which are kicking out helpless old inmates whom they are supposed to care for. The inmates are sent to motels, homeless shelters and other unsafe places and their spots in the nursing homes are being sold to more profitable, more revenue-generating COVID-19 patients. 
Many of these evicted are suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's disease and they need constant care. Since we are on the subject of the United States, let's not forget the corrupt senator, just one, called Richard Burr. He had confidential information in advance that COVID-19 would be hitting his country. And what do you think he did with that information? He hit the stock market to protect his private investments. Meanwhile, he assured the public that everything was under control. In Delhi, the capital of India, the city government is headed by a man called Arvind Kejriwal. He is one of those outsiders who entered politics less than a decade back. He promised transparency and clean governance. But the way he has handled the coronavirus pandemic has exposed him as one of the worst administrators in the Indian system. Under his nose, private hospitals are looting helpless victims of COVID-19. He misrepresented data on the spread of the pandemic and made a royal mess of Delhi's health infrastructure. You'd think after decades of federal largesse, the capital of India would have been able to conquer the pandemic easily. There must be hundreds of examples waiting to be searched on the internet. One of the most unfortunate casualties of the coronavirus pandemic has been the near wipeout of the world's free press. Journalists are being laid off. That's good news for big government because there are no more uncomfortable questions to confront, no nosy reporters to be wary of. So, is government a hindrance to governance or is it a necessary evil? This question is emerging in the minds of people, especially young people all over the world. Most recently in America, in the context of the police, an agency of government that citizens are most likely to see and have contact with. All right, we're going to get right to it. We have breaking news out of Minneapolis at this hour where Minneapolis City Council members at a rally about an hour ago have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. Andy McDonald was at the community event at Powderhorn Park where they made that announcement. Thank you, Chris. Well, their main message here was to invest in the community and not the police. About a thousand people were here at Powderhorn Park, many still present here on this side of the slope as they watched Minnesota, Minneapolis City Council member, a majority of them, uh, vote in favor of replacing, removing Minneapolis police and replacing them with community based public safety. The sign in front of the stage stated their motive to defund police city council. President Lisa Bender said their efforts to reform have, quote, failed. The officials say they're looking to other ways to maintain public safety in their communities and are starting a conversation on how to move forward together. Defund the police. Abolish the police. After the 25th of May 2020, when police brutality caused the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis in the United States of America, it was as if some unknown pain center in the global consciousness had gotten exposed. People of all nationalities and ethnicities in many countries around the world protested racial attitudes, especially the ones that dominate government policies. The police was the first target of their outrage. Now, it may sound like a mad suggestion, but nobody's actually asking for policing to go away. The new age demands a more humane institution, one that is suited to its locale and is accountable to the people of its locale, not to some federal capital office. We live in an economy of punishment. We, as in black people, as in poor people, as in marginal people, um, police are not used to keep us safe. What we've seen over the last seven years is black people being killed, humiliated, violated, sexually assaulted, maimed by law enforcement. And we haven't seen it get any better. Reimagining public safety in this moment is a matter of life or death. Now, in my personal opinion, defunding or abolishing the police would make the social justice scale tip unfavorably against the poor. The police does serve the poorest of the poor in most times. If the institution of the police vanishes, the rich would just buy personal security for themselves and the poor would be left vulnerable. Yet, on the other hand, the police is low-hanging fruit. It is one of those aspects of big government that people identify easily with. So, part of the anti-police psychology may be explained through the root cause theory. I think the root cause is our collective frustration with big government, which is resplendent with apathy and insensitivity. Now, I am sure that the demand for defunding and abolishing the police will simmer down sooner than later, and then the focus will turn to finding a middle ground. But nobody can deny that the police forces are organized around pre-modern lines. 
that needs to change and with the same objectivity we need to assess big government after the covid-19 experience experts are predicting that there will be a second wave of infections and deaths in most countries much bigger than what we have seen from march onwards already there are cases rising in germany united states and chile our governments fixated as they are in somehow keeping the economy open don't have a clue on how to cope with this the fear for many in countries emerging from lockdown is that a second wave is just around the corner i think the reality is that until we have a vaccine and until that vaccine is widely distributed we are going to have more waves a failed government makes people despondent but the failure of a government to manage a pandemic is particularly concerning when experts are predicting that the world is on the brink of a global mental health crisis people are depressed and getting apathetic thoughts as to the purpose of their lives i talked about this in two episodes before i hope you will watch them if you haven't already on top of that scientists and experts are predicting that there will be waves of covid-19 until a vaccine is discovered and distributed widely so in this situation i want to express a positive viewpoint we need to rethink governance we need to look beyond old fashioned ideas that no longer work big government is that old fashioned idea far away from delhi is kerala the state in southern india it was in kerala that india's first covid-19 case was reported back in january 2020 now kerala has been uniquely successful in flattening the curve one of the biggest reasons is that kerala devolved power to the most basic unit of the population the local communities the village council kerala does not function like a corporate state that operates out of a boardroom in the capital it has broken itself up into tiny atoms of perfect governance each unit has its own financial and human capital to fight the pandemic armed with intimate knowledge of local needs that is the kerala model but will big government concede to this idea that is a question that i leave you with thank you for watching i'm going to be back next week with more such fundamental questions in his famous play julius caesar william shakespeare had one of his characters cassius tell brutus another character this the fault dear brutus is not in our stars but in ourselves that we are underlings take care